Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z have been a big part of video games for as long as I can remember, even longer. Akira Toriyama, seminal classic, is easily one of the most famous franchises of all time, and anyone growing up in the 90s or 2000s is sure to have some form of thought about it. Some more intense than others, I'm sure. Regarding gaming, there seems to be a misconception that a majority of Dragon Ball video games don't quite hit the mark. And sure, maybe that's true for a handful of stinkers so stinky they've become legendary. Your Ultimate Battle 22s and Dragon Ball Z Saga has got enough badness in them to last a lifetime. But this just makes it all the more crazy that the entire series garnered more sales than the likes of Metal Gear, Tekken, Diablo, Kirby, even Kingdom Hearts has nothing on the King of Shonen. So what I want to do today is focus on the positives, the good stuff. Surely there hasn't been nearly 40 years of Dragon Ball video games with only a single handful of fun titles. We'll also be looking into Japanese exclusives because I'm not not going to talk about Hyper Dimension. That one was awesome. Put away your battle for Z and unlicensed dragon powers. We're going for quality. Don't change that dial. This planet's not big enough for the both of us. No problemo. Make room for Dragon Ball Z next. So yo, it's Austin, and today we're gonna be talking about a bunch of good Dragon Ball games. We've done the bad ones in the past, and I figured it was well past time to talk about the ones that, you know, bring a smile to your face. The first Dragon Ball game that I played that made me pop off was probably the original Budokai Tenkaichi. There was something about its scale back in 2005 that I thought went unmatched. The same year as one of the worst games, unfortunately, Dragon Ball Z Sagas, although I think almost 20 years of complaining about this thing is more than enough. Not like I can do any better, I can't code, or at least I couldn't. I've been learning with today's sponsor, Boot.dev. Haven't heard of Boot.dev? Well, it's simple. What if we made learning back in development fun? E-learning isn't the most exciting thing in the world, especially when it comes to coding. So, Boot.dev set out to use modern game design elements to help students practice towards their goals. The way it works is pretty simple. You make yourself an account, you pick from one of many courses, and get to type in. Boot.dev's tutorials and classes gamify the process of learning code, so you're actually learning how to work in Python and Go while also working your way up the leaderboards. There's daily quests and also an active Discord community to help motivate you towards an active career and back-end development, which I don't know if you know, is a pretty big money maker. If you find yourself stuck or needing a little help, there's even a little helper named Boots, a not-so-little bear wizard who will do his best to help you understand exactly what you need to do. And if you don't have the means to pay for a membership, you're able to access all the content on the site to read and watch in guest mode. So if this interests you and you're curious to see what it's about, you can click the link down in the description and use the code AUSTINERUPTION to get 25% off your first payment for Boot.dev. That's 25% off your first month or year depending on the subscription. It's definitely worth checking out. Boot.dev is a great tool for aspiring programmers, and it would have been something I would have loved to have back in the day. That's Austin Eruption for 25% off today. Thanks to Boot.dev for the sponsor, and now, on with the Dragon Ball games. I figured that our best starting point is gonna be well, as far back as we can go. The very first Dragon Ball game, Dragon Daihikyo, came out in 1986, wasn't associated with Bandai at all, and was so early that the Red Ribbon Army was brand spanking new. But, is it good? It's, uh... It's okay. We've reached a point where it's hard for me to judge old 80s games without just sounding whiny, as technology's come so far. One look at Dragon Daihikyo here on the Super Cassette Vision, and you just know what you're getting into. A single MIDI line doing a rundown rendition of Makafushigi Adventure, and a little baby Goku wiggling a stick. Plus, whatever this is. That's not to say all of the early 80s and 90s games were mid, though. They just didn't make it stateside in time and enter my field of view till the early 2000s when emulation was popping off due to Dragon Ball slow burn popularity in the States. By the time we were watching Raditz get owned, Super Mario 64 and Final Fantasy 7 were all the rage, so suddenly Dragon Ball Daimao Fukatsu was very out of date. For some reason, a vast majority of early Dragon Ball games weren't fighters or platformers, but turn-based card battle RPGs. And by that I mean if you take the first 10 DB games made from 86 to 93, 7 of them were using cards and numbers. Although, technically 
technically eight because the first actual fighter, Dragon Ball Z Gekitoten Kaichi Budokai, came with its own barcode scanner that was required to play it at all. Going through all of these with fan translations and writing about them would take a master's thesis amount of time, so I'm not gonna do that, but for those wanting a retro Dragon Ball Z RPG, I've heard that these are pretty good. I will say that the music was great, and animation effects that happened in battle were really cool coming out of this old thing. You would take a lot of time to set up your turns and attacks and then watch battles unfold, and considering I can't read kanji, uh, just look at the big numbers. Which brings us to something that my small brain can understand, fighting games. Uh, it took a while for these to be decent. The Super Butoden series were archaic to say the least. I loved the spectacle they were going for, and the sprites from Butoden 3 were used by every sprite comic author for years. They just had this weird clunky jank about them that really failed to get up to speed with Street Fighter 2, which had been out for years at this point. Even the Sega Saturn version, Shin Butoden, had a lot of these frustrations and ends up valuing the spectacle of someone doing a massive energy blast over solid gameplay. To be fair, that is pretty cool. That's why, in the face of infamously terrible games like Ultimate Battle 22, something like Hyper Dimension is even cooler. No, not that Hyper Dimension, we're talking about the boys. Coming out late for the Super Nintendo in 1996, Hyper Dimension actually released shortly after Z reached its final episode in Japan, so this game had everything, even the same developer. Tosei would be responsible for a vast majority of anything involving dragons and balls in the 90s, including the pretty decent Super Nintendo RPGs, so how they went and made their best fighter on the way out of the franchise is beyond me. Hyper Dimension functions as a best of 16-bit era fighter. It's got a bit more weight than its predecessors, interesting multi-lane combat, and some cool Mode 7 aerial battles. Sure, you've only got 10 characters to pick from, but considering everything they were trying to do here, this was dope. Again, I never even tried to play this until I was old enough to get my butt handed to me in Tekken 4, so it's hard to judge, but I could have seen myself loving this as a kid, even if I wouldn't have a single clue who Boo was for another six years. At the time, Hyper Dimension was definitely a solid goodbye to what would become the most influential manga of the modern era. That is, at least until it was ruined with Dragon Ball GT Final Bout the very next year, the very first English release. Show me the results of your training. I will now end this. Hyper Dimension is a fantastic early fighting game, and that's really the genre that Dragon Ball video games are most known for. You take two or more characters from the wide cast of them, put them against each other in fisticuffs, and see who comes out the victor. Or in some cases, just piling Gokus on top of other Gokus. I think any Dragon Ball Z fans had late nights filled with plenty of fun fighting game action with friends, and thankfully that's been around long enough to have happened in multiple generations. There's only so much I can say about these though, so why not tackle this like a best of fighting games? Believe it or not, things did get better after Hyper Dimension, it just took a second. The PlayStation 1 Saturn era of Dragon Ball fighting games was a strange one, with one of the bigger releases being an import that gets praised quite a bit. Dragon Ball Z The Legend is a hybrid of a fighting game and cinematic experience where you attempt to stagger enemies with melee attacks in order to pull off big TV show explosions. It's pretty confusing, and I'm not really sure if I liked it much, but it was a big hit among early fans. Which brings me to the first fighter that hit the states. No, not you. I'm talking about the Dragon Ball Z Budokai series. The first two were just okay. One of them gave me big buyer's remorse, actually. <laughs> Sorry, Dimps. But the third one was really good. These games are all incremental upgrades going further and further into the narrative of Dragon Ball while also giving us more mechanics, characters, and things. It really felt like these kept getting better over time, and when Budokai 3 hit my PlayStation 2, I was in heaven. Even if the combo system was lacking, to say the least. You just do a little punch, 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 kamehameha. Budokai 3's big hook was definitely the Dragon Universe story mode. Rather than just clicking on missions, you actually had a giant world map to fly around for each campaign and character. Granted, it was a lot of flying around aimlessly looking for question mark, question mark, question mark events to maybe get a Dragon Ball, but this was the first time I really got a sense of immersion 
came from a licensed game. The fact that you could move around the map that fast was nuts, even if it was just to re-experience the same story again. Although you could also get into some what-if scenarios involving Omega Shinron. It was the first game to recognize his ridiculous presence. Budokai 3 is great. Following a similar trend of continuously getting better, at the same time, the Budokai Tenkaichi games were, oh, that was the good stuff. Originally called Dragon Ball Z Sparking, this was developer Spike's attempt to take the fighting concept and changing the camera to be behind the player. And what a good decision that was. Once again, hitting their stride with the third game, this spinoff series said, what if we just let you have fun? And for any Dragon Ball Z fan, fun was had. Name a character. As long as their name isn't launched, they're most likely in this game. You had Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta, you had Pycon, we got Devil Man. Who remembers Devil Man? It is a force of unimaginable evil. Next time, can you try purple? All in all, there were 158 playable characters, and while they all control similarly, they had a lot of unique animations, and that attention to detail is pretty out of this world, especially for the PlayStation 2 and Wii era. I'm just glad we got Goku mid. Heck, even the upcoming Sparking Zero is bringing good old mid Goku back. <laughs> I haven't even gotten to the game. Tenkai is a blast. It puts you directly into the action with the camera, which allows for the fast and furious battles of Dragon Ball Z to be felt in a way that I don't think was captured up until that point. The counter teleports were fast, and stage destruction happened on what felt like a massive scale, and even if multiplayer chopped the screen in half, you knew how to hold your own. I will say, Tenkaichi 3's story mode's a little lacking in comparison to other entries or entire games. You've got a more standard stage select, and while it's probably unfair to compare it doesn't quite have that sense of the world that Budokai had. However, if you ask me what I'd rather play, it'd probably be the one with a Raleigh from Dr. Slump. <laughs> So let's head to the next generation. A lot of people seem to think that the sixth generation of consoles had the best Dragon Ball video games, and with contenders like the two we just talked about, that's kinda hard to argue against. However, don't go sleeping on Dragon Ball Z Burst Limit. Also with a bonus DVD, let's go. I feel like Budokai and Tenkaichi 3 are very opposite games. One had a more slightly traditional take on fighters, and the other was kind of a proto-arena fighting game, the kind you see all over the place these days. Shame about that Jujutsu Kaisen one, huh? That main menu looks like a DVD from 2003. Burst Limit, on the other hand, falls directly in between the two, and I don't think I fully appreciated it when I was younger. I think I had brain rot due to Tenkaichi expectations, but playing this now, I'm realizing, hey, it's pretty good. It doesn't quite have the depth of something like Street Fighter 4, which would hit arcades a mere month later, but it does strike a good balance between spectacle and mechanics. Unfortunately, it doesn't go past the Cell Saga, which does seem like a step back after the past few years of Dragon games, but we did get this. That's over 9,000! What? They did the thing! Burst Limit doesn't just hold up. I think it's actually aged really well. It's probably my favorite of the early 7th generation Dragon Ball Z fighters, and I think that's because it tried to maintain that DBZ battle fanciness while also keeping it simple. Combos are easy to pull off. You've got all sorts of launchers to change the background into another arena. You've got cinematic attacks and combos that happen mid-battle. You can transform. You can do lots of button mashing and relive your favorite DBZ moments with the in-game engine that might look a little uncanny candy nowadays put blew me away in 2008. I think people are sleeping on burst limit. Stop, Stop it. I wish I got to play this one online back in the day on Xbox Live. I feel like it would have been a good place to get the worst messages of all time. Moving on, and actually by the same developer, would be a more personal take on a Dragon Ball fighting game. With the series moving into Super and getting a renaissance in the 2010s, we'd of course see, well, more, and Namco Bandai ushered that in with Dragon Ball Xenoverse, which I didn't really like. Oh. I dig the sequel though. Dragon Ball Xenoverse 2, for the just about every platform you can imagine, is now eight years old and is still getting updates. New characters, new modes, entire campaigns. This thing's gotten so much support that I'm tempted to call it a games as a service, which is objectively wrong, but still. Xenoverse's whole hook is that you play as your own custom created dude, be that a boo person or a Saiyan. You embark through portals as a time patroller and make sure that the proper events of Dragon Ball happen. Akira Toriyama's wonderful art style is on full display here, which means my creative character gets to look like this. And 
I wouldn't have it any other way. Xenoverse 2 feels like a slower version of Tenkaichi, but it actually works. There's a lot of RPG-like mechanics where you'll level up and unlock different attacks and forms for your character to make them play how you want. The story's a little whatever, it's just a lot of fan service and run-ins with some of your favorite characters from the decades-old franchise. But any DBZ fan is gonna go in, and it seems like many did, as Xenoverse 2 has garnered well over 10 million sales worldwide, which is ridiculous. That's like double Final Fantasy IX, more than just about every PlayStation 5 game. People yearn to make Dragon Ball OCs, and uh, now that I'm thinking about it, them should do this with One Piece too. Speaking of 10 million copies sold, I would be a total idiot if I didn't talk about Dragon Ball Fighters. I mean, it's maybe one of the best Dragon Ball video games out there. It's definitely got a ridiculous following. It's been in the Evo lineup several times and gotten years of support. It's one of the best 1v1 team-based fighting games out there. It's absolutely gorgeous to look at, and guess what? It's got rollback now. I don't really have much I can say about fighters besides like, yeah, it's amazing. Developer Arc System Works is one of the premier fighting game developers, and while, I mean, it's no Persona 4 Arena Ultimax, Fighters is an absolute blast just about any second you're touching the controller. Unless it's navigating the online lobby, what in the world were they thinking? You can see the love oozing off of every individual frame in combat. The fast speeds and beginner-friendly controls lead to casual players having a great time, and it's honestly a perfect game to whip out at a party. I love Fighters. But this isn't actually Arc System Works' first Dragon Ball Rodeo. Three years prior, and on the freaking 3DS of all platforms, would be Dragon Ball Z Extreme Butoden. And this feels like I'm playing an early version of Fighters. Extreme Butoden has no right to be as good as it is, especially on the 3DS. Playing Smash on this thing is how I drifted the analog stick, so my first thought isn't to play an intense button masher on the thing, but hey, it works. Do you want fancy sprites doing fancy screen destroying energy blasts on the go? You got it. You want an easy to understand combo system with lots of fun spectacle and depth? Yep. You want to touch the screen to use assists? No, not really, but I'll deal with smudging up that screen. Extreme Butoden has a lot of different single player content, some of which is your standard story affair, the other being a lot of what if scenarios. You'll go through a board game style map doing missions, talking to people, beating Vegeta in a fight, and getting Bulma, whatever that means. When it comes to portable fighting games, I typically have the lowest of expectations, but if you ask me, Arc System Works blew it out of the water and gave us something that led to one of their greatest so far. But uh, now that I'm thinking about it, Arxis should do this with One Piece too. Oh wait, they actually did! Great Pirate Coliseum. Put these two together and that will be the jump force we've all been waiting for. So you've seen the best of the fight in games, at least in my opinion. I'm sure there's someone out there saying, what about Raging Blast and... What about it? I mean, it, it might be okay, but I'm, I'm, I'm too old to argue about that now. So instead, why don't we dive into some of the weirder stuff? For instance, a Punch-Out clone called Dragon Ball VR Versus. What happens when you combine the idea of the Kinect with technology from 1994? Well, you get Dragon Ball Z VR Versus, a Japanese arcade exclusive that has the honor of being largely forgotten. This thing was originally conceived as a Sega-made four-player punchy-kicky affair that uses similar technology to the Activator. Yeah, you guys remember that bad boy? Well, that never came to fruition, but we did get a pretty decent behind-the-shoulder fighter resembling Nintendo's classic with a banging soundtrack and ridiculous action. You get to control one of the typical popular Z fighters from this era, yet another game without Krillin, and fight your way through stages until you tackle this, uh, original character? Azoto, the super monster who's only ever been in this and Super Dragon Ball Heroes. Which to be fair, so has everyone. This one's fun for a few quarters, but speaking of heroes, we, uh, we might as well talk about that. If you don't know anything about Dragon Ball Heroes, I do not blame you at all. It's one of the many, many card-based arcade games that were all Japanese exclusive. Originally the Data Card Ass Dragon Ball series, which is an unfortunate name, to W Bakuretsu Impact, to Kai Dragon Battlers, to Heroes, and eventually Super Heroes. You can bet your sweet thing there's been a collectible card arcade game for Dragon Ball running since their inception in the mid-2000s. This particular rendition, Super Dragon Ball Heroes, ended up getting its own web-exclusive show in 2018, which no one really seems to care much about. 
about. It's just mostly what if stuff, dimension hopping, time traveling original characters, and about as close to Dragon Ball AF as we'd officially go. Despite all these games being Japanese exclusive and all gotcha based, Bandai Namco and once again, Dimps would team up to release an official version for the Switch and PC that would actually make it stateside, and I don't hate it. Basically, if you've ever wanted to see what Super Saiyan 4 Gohan would look like, this one's for you. Yeah, that's official. I don't know how much I can like actually recommend Super Dragon Ball Heroes World Mission. It's kind of ugly. It feels clunky in execution, and you could tell they were quickly porting this outside of arcades because it's telling you to jiggle cards around, and I'm sure as heck not doing that with his Xbox controller. Any dopamine hit you'd get from the machine popping at a shiny Super Saiyan 4 Bardock card is instead replaced with grinding and gotcha machines showing you not so shiny PNGs, and frankly, it looks not real. What is this interface? But also, you look at that meta score and it's a nice 69. That means it's a 7 out of 10, and I can't go hating on that. The actual gameplay is simple enough. It's a lot of RPG lane management and timed button presses. It's kind of like how Legacy of Goku 2 is great for a specific type of Western fan. Heroes is perfect for power scaling freaks, card game addicts, gotcha maniacs, and people who just want to watch all of the characters do ridiculous chain attacks. Just be prepared to get introduced to a bunch of goobers you've never seen before. Who is this? What's going on? How powerful is the straight jacket? I can't recommend World Heroes to everyone, but for the like 10 people watching this who had a light bulb flick on, it's a decent Dragon Ball themed time waster. Only on sale. Dragon Ball is no stranger to bizarre concepts like this. The first time the West would get one of their turn based RPGs would be with Legendary Super Warriors for the Game Boy Color. Published by Infogrames before they put on their Atari cosplay, Legendary Super Warriors is exactly what it looks like. Turn based Dragon Ball combat going through different battles and stories in the show. It's a deck builder, which is similar to the Japanese only NES and Super Nintendo titles, but on the tiny screen, and honestly, what you see is what you get. Maybe a little less cool in 2024, but 12 year old me had a blast watching these Neo Geo pocket King of Fighters fun size sprites pan across the screen at each other. People really like this one, and I don't blame them. It's all we had. We certainly didn't get Dragon Ball Z Idai Naru Son Goku Densetsu for the PC Engine Super CD. That was a mouthful. I have a really difficult time explaining this one. It's part visual novel, part fighting game, part I have no idea what's supposed to be happening. The whole thing is essentially Gohan recounting stories about Goku to Goten, and I actually love this as a concept. You play as Goku in each of his fights against some of his toughest challenges across the entire series, but also things are happening at such a rapid pace without much explanation that it's hard for me to understand. Apparently this one is regarded as really freaking hard, but I imagine a couple months of Duolingo will do me a solid. However, it is really cool to see iconic moments with that retro 16-bit CD look. Yeah! I always found it wild that the Dragon Ball series of video games was second most in love with RPGs, and my next recommendation happens to be one of those. If you had a 3DS and you didn't pick up Dragon Ball Fusions, you were missing out. I think Dragon Ball Fusions went really under the radar. Developed by Ganbarian, who have been responsible for a crazy amount of license tie-ins since 2001. But wait, there's a Dazumanga Dio game? It's basically Mahjong? <laughs> Dragon Ball Fusions is, as the name implies, an adventure all about the hypest of maneuvers, the fusion dance, or earrings if you can't. You make your OC, you find the Dragon Balls, and wish for a cool tournament to happen so you can strut your stuff. You get sucked into a world where everyone's a super chibi version of themselves, and then you watch Nappa and Raditz become infamous super jobber Nats. Let's go Nats. Fusions is a turn-based RPG that takes a lot of elements from Grandia. Everyone's turns happen on a visible line at the bottom, and you can can influence the speed of things with attacks or even knock people out of bounds to make them reset their turns. You can bump enemies and random OCs into each other, into your teammates for chain attacks, and positioning is king. There just also happens to be a plethora of ridiculous fusions, most of which hilarious. The man, the myth, the legend is back. <laughs> 
Tien Cha, the GOAT! Dragon Ball Fusions is a relatively simple title. You go from zone to zone beating people up, gaining new allies, access to new fusions, and generally doing whatever the heck you want to do while facing against your dumb rival. It's like Pokemon, only with two people's hearts becoming one instead of capturing a wild animal. It's a well-made RPG that's actually visually impressive for the crusty 3DS. Flying around feels cool. The zones have a lot of effort put into them, and if you don't like collecting everything, it's not even that long. I messed up big time and didn't play this until, as of this writing, like four hours ago. So if you haven't, don't be like me, find a copy or perhaps a way to play it since you can't legally get it anywhere else anyways. Nintendo versus the preservation of video games. After waiting through a bunch of oddities for a little bit, I'm sure some of y'all are waiting for the bangers to be popping up and well, guess what? I've already talked about some of them. You don't go 10 and a half years on YouTube without talking about Dragon Ball a few times. Heck, sometimes you even make a 100% video on a video game expecting all of the DLC to be out only for that to not be the case and you just look like a big idiot. The question remains, will Dragon Ball Z Kakarot ever end? Considering the latest piece of DLC, Goku's Next Journey flaunts final episode in season two, I, uh, I'm gonna say no. Dragon Ball Z Kakarot is a game that surprised me. It had a less than stellar reputation when I picked it up, and I was pleasantly surprised to find out that it was gamers with a capital G mostly complaining about nonsense and reputation. Meanwhile, when I finally got around to it, it was probably the most accurate representation of Dragon Ball Z combat that I could imagine. You telling me I could just fly around freely and fight random dudes with my squad of boys? Yeah, let's go. Kakarot has its problems, sure. It's just the positives vastly outweigh the negatives. One day, when I'm like actually certain that CyberConnect 2 and Bandai Namkai are for real done putting out downloadable content for it, I might go and properly re-100% the beast. But for now, all I can say is, hey, it's good. Give it a shot. Just you wait. They're gonna add another card game. We also made an entire video talking about the Legacy of Goku trilogy for the Game Boy Advance. Uh, rather controversial set of games with a radically different reception based on which one you're talking about. Of the three, I think Legacy of Goku 2 was the coolest. It's this bizarre amalgamation of Funimation's Dragon Ball Z with a Webfoot Technologies developed 2D Zelda clone, and if you were to bring this to Japan, I'm sure that it would confuse. Considering Goku's all dying of heart disease in this one, a lot of the other Z fighters take center stage, and what you get is an incredibly unique title with nothing else like it. Well, besides the other two, I guess. Weirdly enough, Legacy 2 has the honor of being the only non-Japanese made Dragon Ball game to make its way over to Japan, where they actually redid all the character sprites to make them look less, well, you know. Legacy of Goku 2 is a cool game for a very specific type of Western Dragon Ball Z fan. You just better love that Bruce Falconer soundtrack. Those two games were featured in their own videos, which you can watch, but that's like not even close to what we've talked about. Recently, we brought up Super wow. Dragon Ball Z, which I still feel is one of the best and most underrated Dragon Ball fighters from the PlayStation 2 era. It's no Budokai 3, although it is a little bit more complicated than Square, 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 Circle. <laughs> I find it incredibly blessed, though, that just about every base Dragon Ball video game has been good, if not great. Dragon Ball Revenge of King Piccolo is an absolute joy to play. Around the time of the series' 25th anniversary, Bandai teamed up with Media Vision, the people behind one of my favorite JRPGs, Wild Arms, and gave us a little classic Dragon Ball adventure that holds up. King Piccolo throws us directly into the fray after the first tournament arc, hence the whole Revenge of King Piccolo subtitle, and gave us a fun beat-em-up adventure for the Wii that I think is totally worth your time. It does a little mashup of gameplay styles where in normal stages you're running around smacking people and doing sonic homing attacks for platforming, then you'll get yoinked into a more traditional arena fighter. It's nothing overly complicated, but is at the end of the day a cute gamey look back at Goku's origins. I'm also just a complete sucker for base Dragon Ball, it's my favorite. And I can't stop thinking about the English theme song. 
But speaking of origins, we also talked about Dragon Ball Origins 1 and 2 sometime last year. And if you haven't played these, then you gotta get on that. The entire concept of the game is in the name. We're going through the classic story once again. It just also has some of the most gorgeous visuals you've seen on the Nintendo DS. Yeah, like the same platform that put out Sonic Chronicles The Dark Brotherhood. Developed by Game Republic of Folklore and Genji fame, Dragon Ball Origins 1 and 2 are essentially clones of the DS format of Zelda, but it works oh so well. You're using the stylus to extend power poles, and everything feels and looks like a perfect representation of the classic show. I love Goku's little run animation, and while both of these are more stage-based affairs, it really goes to show what potential an actual open-world Dragon Ball Adventure title could have been. It's also got one of the best gags in video games. <laughs> Dual screen technology used at its best, never replicated. Both origin games are good, enough said. Which brings me to one more golden oldie that we've already talked about. I won't hold you long. It's Dragon Ball Advanced Adventure, brought to you by Dems, who've done a vast majority of the 3D era fighters in like four games we've already gone into. Advanced Adventure is the type of Dragon Ball game I wanted to see more of. Generally speaking, Dragon Ball is a battle shonen with battling and fighting happening mostly in a one-on-one -on -one set. Seriously, why didn't they just gang up on Cell? Advanced Adventure is what happens when you take the adventure concept from the original show and extend that into a wonderful 2D platforming adventure. It does have a little in common with Revenge of King Piccolo, but is at least, in my opinion, better in every way. It's a relatively short jaunt that sees you going from humble, shot in the face by a teenager beginnings, all the way to defeating King Piccolo. Goku gets stronger between stages as he does in the story, and it's neat to see your power and combat options grow over time. Also similarly to King Piccolo, the tournament arcs play out like a fighting game. And while that's gonna be limited as heck on a Game Boy Advance of all things, I think the whole package is one of the best titles on Nintendo's little handheld. Hyperbolic? Sure. I just really like Dragon Ball. While it is a bit on the shorter side, coming in at a relatively quick two hours, you do unlock Gremlin Krillin too, so anyone who wants to play through the story as this little shit's gonna be happy. The only thing that could make this better is if Dimps went and made a fully featured Great Saiyan Man video game. Sidebar. If you're a Saiyan man hater, we can't be friends. Ever. Don't mock me, you little freak. <laughs> Alrighty, y'all. I got one more I want to talk about today, and I think it's a special one. You know how in the beginning of the show, Z, you go from Reddit's arriving to the Saiyans being there in a matter of what, 10 episodes? A full year passes by in like an instant where Goku's running a bunch and hanging out with snake women. Our next and final game decided, what if we take that space and dedicate a full length JRPG to it? If you haven't played Dragon Ball Z Attack of the Saiyans, you're missing out. Attack of the Saiyans in concept is not what the average Dragon Ball fan wants. It's a turn-based RPG that focuses on the smaller moments. It's built up to feel like an actual adventure RPG with a wide cast of characters instead of treading all of the similar ground. Heck, you don't even get to play as a single Saiyan until at least an hour in. Attack of the Saiyans fills in the gaps between the 23rd tournament till the end of the Saiyan saga. And that means we're starting small. You're Krillin checking in on his original school. You're Yamcha hanging out with monsters carrot for some ungodly reason. And wouldn't you know it, it's all put together by the people over at Monolith Soft. Yeah, like Xenoblade Chronicles Monolith Soft. Ah. Attack of the Saiyans is Nintendo DS perfection and a super solid adaptation of a world famous license at the same time. I don't know how they pulled it off, especially since it wasn't even close to the first RPG the franchise has had, but the sheer amount of extra content, world building, and filler led to one of, if not the most memorable Dragon Ball video games I've ever played. It's got a solid soundtrack by Tsukasa Masako, responsible for all the classic Shin Megami Tenseis. It's got fantastic sprite work, both in battle and on the maps. The writing is true to the characters, and we're allowed to see things from a different perspective, and considering how much I love the original Dragon Ball series, Series, this is exactly the kind of thing I love. The combat system's pretty simple. You take control of three people at a time who can do normal attacks, special key blasts, or bigger team sparking hits. Whenever an enemy strikes at you, you've got the opportunity to block, like in Super Mario RPG, but it's also a different button depending on where the enemy hits. Truthfully, it's not that 
that deep, but for a classic JRPG from this era, it's more than enough. There's interactive things on the maps that you can blast away with key, there's lots of characters that have movesets that'll easily differentiate them, and most importantly, there's a lot of goofy filler and fun moments that really open up the world of Dragon Ball. You gotta love walking around towns and having really stupid NPC interactions. You can see a temple over there, right? Well, guess what? That's a temple. It, it sure is, kiddo. The biggest negatives I can think of are, of course, the sheer amount of random battles. This is a JRPG from the 2000s, which means that every few steps will have you into another combat. Modern RPGs have really sped this up, so if you don't have the patience, you'll definitely be feeling the game length. Although it's only 23 some odd hours, which if you ask me, is the perfect length for a DS title. Attack of the Saiyans can be repetitive, it can drag out a lot of sequences, but it also found a way to illustrate a plethora of character moments and let smaller personalities shine whenever Big Bad Goku's not on the screen. Despite the game being called Attack of the Saiyans, Vegeta and Nappa don't even arrive until the last fourth of the game, so it's built up in a way that feels more personal with these characters that you've been playing as for hours. And don't forget, we get more training in hell with Goku. Truthfully, I wanted Dragon Ball Z Kakarot to be more like this, but with that combat system. I've always loved the small slice of life moments in Dragon Ball, and to see them represented in video game form, freaking rules. Attack of the Saiyans may not be for everyone, heck, it doesn't even have a single Super Saiyan in it, but if you just want to play one heck of a hidden licensed gem, it doesn't get much better than this. Maybe just have a hotkey ready to double up that emulation speed for grinding. I don't got time to cover full RPGs, I'm sorry. I'm getting old and dying. What? 9000! <laughs> So there you have it, a bunch of good ass Dragon Ball video games. I think in the past I've tended to lean more into the bad stuff because well, it's entertaining, but with everything that's been going on, I wanted to highlight some of the brighter moments. It's a shame that Monolith Software didn't get to continue into the Dragon Ball Z storyline with like Namek and the Cell games, but I guess Xenoblade will have to do. What's your favorite Dragon Ball video game? Surely not everyone's gonna say Budokai 3 and Fighters, right? If there's one I missed that you wanna see me talk about in the future, let me know down below. I actually had to ax a couple because, well, there's over 40 Dragon Ball games, but I love me anything licensed. It's kind of my thing. If you liked today's video, leave it a like, give me a subscription, or if you want to support the channel directly, you can head on over to the Patreon, become a backer, or buy a t-shirt over at the Pixel Empire. It all goes back into the channel, to my editors, and helps us create stuff like this in a short amount of time. I mean, what, we started this six days ago? Let's go. Anyways, I've been Austin, and I hope we did the lesser known Dragon Ball game some justice. Catch me next time when we finally do that deep dive I've been talking about. Also, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll finish Kakarot one day, I swear. I swear. Thank you all so much for watching. Special Patreon shout out to Aaron Quolek, Benna Oswald, Blackfoot Ferret, Blake Thomas, Charles Rosner, Cheeks, Chris Shelton, DX Buster, Dylan Snyder, Hey Quiggles, Idlevice, J. Roos, Jacoby Fitzpatrick, Kevin Zanowski, Rare Find It, Ryan Talbert, and Vox. Thank you so much for your generous support. Yeah, I wanted to like wear brown today. That was weird. You didn't really see it, but there's like a giant fish on the shirt. It's pretty sick. Now that we're at the end of this, you could tell I was a huge fan of Toriyama's work, especially if you followed the channel, and I wanted to celebrate some of the games that he was a part of in the only way that I knew how. Definitely check out some of the RPGs on this list, and if you haven't played Chrono Trigger, you should really play Chrono Trigger, like right now. I also wanted to say thank you to all of the Patreon supporters once again. Without you guys, we literally couldn't do this, and I thank you all so much. While I have you here, uh, what color shirt? should I wear next? I'll, I'll do it. Okay, bye.